All right, okay, welcome everyone to the sales enablement training for, what is it, November 1st. Uh, we are going to do part two of the sales enablement for uh, Azure DevOps, formerly known as uh, VSTS, or uh, um, Visual Studio Team Services, and TFS, which is a Team Foundation Server. Okay, so, <clears throat> Joel asked uh, last time kind of one of the uh, one of the key questions that we want to talk about the rest of this session, which is uh, what do we feel are our top value statements against Azure DevOps? How do we approach this? So I'm going to cover two areas on this page, um, strengths and weaknesses, or I'm sorry, three areas on this page, strengths and weaknesses, and then further down the page, um, positioning based on mostly those strengths and weaknesses. So high level that you guys can go read the details, but um, one of the strengths that they have that we know about is that they are in the enterprise. They have a pretty good foothold for a lot of things and not just necessarily for development tools, but they can extend uh, their enterprise software, you know, uh, sales into that, that area, even if they're not already there. So that's, that's a challenge that we're going to have to figure out how to face with them. One of their strengths, again, I mentioned in, or I mentioned when I brought up that presentation and that they're obviously playing on is they're a large organization and what many consider a very legacy organization and they converted themselves using DevOps methods uh, to doing DevOps and being very efficient at software delivery. Uh, so they are able to use themselves as a solid example of how their tooling works for that purpose um, and, and uh, they did use all of their tooling and they developed the tooling based on that experience. Uh, and the key here is that they didn't just do it, but they're being very vocal about it. So there's plenty of material out there about Microsoft folks sharing at, um, at Merge and you know, Does and Velocity and all these different conferences about uh, the process that they went through and what they learned. And so they're being the kind of organization that we like to see in, in the DevOps world which is they're sharing what they learned and how they got there, which is great, um, but that also gives them a lot of credibility in this space. So that's, that's something we're gonna have to face. Um, they have a lot of technology partners, uh, which means they have a lot of potential for, you know, a leg up on us on, on you know, there. I mean, if we decide integrations, you know, I think one of our keys is integrations is not the best because you have this, you know, plugins you have to deal with and, and you have, you know, changing code and you've got uh, all sorts of challenges and you don't have the best interface, et cetera. Um, but most of the industry right now uh, that in this space basically reaches out to all their partners or, or does integrations to bring in capabilities um, that we are building. And they have uh, lots of partners as we know. Uh, and they are, Microsoft is like, as you guys are aware, but next to Atlassian, probably above Atlassian, they are one of the few competitors out there that's got products that covers the entire SDLC stack. Um, not all of it's called Azure at this point, but it probably will be. So <laughs> they're turning everything into Azure. Um, it's not all integrated into the uh, Azure DevOps suite either, but, uh, but they have capabilities across all of that. So let's talk about weaknesses. Um, so as I mentioned before, the security uh, scanning is not built in. Uh, and, uh, and that's, that, that's, that's pretty significant. <clears throat> and I have under positioning some more points about that. Um, there's a very valid concern about cloud lock-in, uh, or I'm sorry, vendor lock-in, um, because they are providing the cloud services and they're, that's a big part of their revenue stream coming in. So um, a lot of you know, folks are, are, are leery about whether or not they're going to be forced into using Microsoft's cloud by using Microsoft's tools. Uh, and so the burden of proof that they're not going to do this is on Microsoft, so especially given their past history. Dan, however, you mentioned yeah. earlier that they are cloud agnostic. So how do you, how do we reconcile that? If they're cloud agnostic, therefore, it, I don't see where they would be locked in. Well, so being able to use another vendor's tools, or sorry, being able to go to any vendor uh, for cloud, uh, doesn't mean that it's not, 
that it's not more compelling to 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 use if you have a certain set of tools that you're already using that are tied into all the other pieces. Um, it, it can be harder to pull out of that. So um, they can do things that can be very um, compelling. Uh, they can make their products that you're become dependent on work best with, right? Um, and I think that's that's where the uh, the concern is. You're right. Um, you can always move to another cloud vendor, but there are switching costs. And granted, with things like Kubernetes or, or more containers, uh, the switching costs are coming down um, quite a bit. And that is kind of the whole point. Uh, but there are still things that Microsoft has proven to be very adept at this that that can say, okay, well, if you're using our, our SCM, uh, the test suite really works a lot better. And the, this works a lot better. And the uh, project and portfolio management works better together and that kind of thing. So that can drown, that can be used to drown out people and to force, force hands. Also from a contract perspective, maybe that's to the benefit of some of, uh, uh, of some, some prospects. Um, it, it, they can strong hand still because they have a lot of power and we'll have to see how that unfolds. They may be completely cloud agnostic and 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 not not try and push and take advantage of that fact, but it is a fear that's out there. Um, and if you read around, you'll see that folks are are concerned about that. Um, so VSTS and TFS, they've been out for a while. Um, Azure DevOps is built. It really is basically a rebadging at this point of those products. Um, as a weakness, if a customer is not happy with it for whatever reason, um, when you come in in a scenario where you're brought in because they have those tools and they're talking to you and looking for something else, for example, um, you know, the name change and the potential price drops that Microsoft will put in place aren't gonna fix uh, the underlying tool issues. Um, so if it doesn't work, it, it doesn't work. Um, and they have that history built up right now, so. Uh, some of it may be good, some of it may not. Uh, on the pipeline side, these are more smaller things, and, and I marked these as ephemeral because right now they're they're true, but I'm sure they will change rapidly as as uh, as Microsoft develops and, and releases on a three week cycle. Uh, the pipelines, um, as code, as I mentioned, is uh, it's actually a different pipeline than the ones that you would build using the UI. So if you built pipelines in the VSTS or even the Azure DevOps UI, um, and then you want to then tweak them using code, you can't do that. They're absolutely literally separate. The YAML stuff is just, it's almost like an experiment. It's early, it's preview. Um, you actually, it's on by default, but if you want to use the UI, uh, you have to um, instance-wide turn it off. Okay? Pipelines, you can use the YAML pipelines. And that's what this is kind of talking about here. And then under evidence is the whole page where the discussion of this happened. Uh, right now, again, ephemeral, um, you can't link work items or issues, what we call issues, with builds. Um, the the YAML-based uh, pipelines are just disconnected from that. Um, again, I'm sure that that will close quickly, um, but, and this is all just, this is really, they're building this out. And that's really the key here is they're still pipelines is early for them. This, this particular type, you know, YAML based pipelines is very early for them. And as I mentioned, still in a preview feature. Um, and if you want to not use it, you have to go turn it off. So how do we, what do we do with this? And again, I'm going to remind everyone, this is, this is kind of early. Uh, we know what we know about, uh, BSTS and TFS, um, we're just starting to collect information about that into one place. And so this is as a team, we need to build up how we're going to, uh, how we're going, you know, what is going to be our, our best attack path uh, when we come face to face with them. Uh, I mentioned the security scanning piece um, a couple times. Um, it's integrations for them, uh, which means, you know, all the standard problems, two vendor UIs, more friction, uh, higher overall cost because you have to actually pay for each of those ones that you integrate in, um, and you know a lot of maintenance requirements and disjointed visibility. Uh, we are the number one in market of self-managed Git repos, right? We're two thirds of the self-managed market. Um, their Git repo isn't really leading in any sense. Um, 
So we have that built in. Um, our self-managed and hosted uh, versions come full functionality, uh, uh, um, equivalent functionality on the release dates. Um, their self-managed version, uh, which they're trying to push people away from, is going to be three to four months behind any new changes or capabilities added to uh, to the online to the SaaS version. And, and this is the point we talked about: Microsoft, a provider of cloud services, um, which is their money maker. So they're going to do what they can to sculpt things to be biased towards using their services. So a couple things I want to point out not to use. Um, we're proud and we should be of the fact that we're top rated in CI by Forrester last year, 27, Q3 2017. Um, but I want to point out that right below us on that chart is Microsoft, right? So uh, they're not, uh, they're, they're lower in what their current offering has. And this is probably because of the pipeline build out and, you know, and how their pipelines were. Um, but they're strong in strategy. So it's not a great argument because they're on the chart with us in, in the same quadrant or in the same wave, part of the wave. Um, this, uh, and this uh, actually, Joel kind of asked this as well. Uh, GitLab is better for .NET shops. Don't use that. We're not. Um, and I'm just being straight honest, we have some work to do there. Um, how we're going to position against that, we need to work on. Um, GitLab can do .NET because we can do anything but it's better, it's not better than Microsoft in this area. For example, they have a binary repository that also does NuGet packages, um, which is a .NET specific packaging mechanism. We don't have that yet. We have Maven right now. Um, GitLab doesn't have built-in facilities for building NuGet packages either, which they do because it's kind of native to their stuff. Um, so two things to be aware of, don't go out and, and fight with those because those aren't, those aren't strong. Actually, I th actually, Dan, I, I think the Forester gives us some credibility as well. So I'm not sure I would, I'm not sure I would be nervous about presenting that. But it, it, I wouldn't. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm not saying don't present it. It absolutely gives us credibility. Um, don't hold it up as the as the uh, you know the torch on on you know why pick us over them. Um, it may be one of the of the quill you know arrows in the in the uh, quill, but. Um, and, and definitely we should make the point we are very strong CI, the strongest, um, but just be aware that they have a pretty easy comeback on that, which is that they're right there too. So questions, uh, oh, I'm gonna turn off the, uh, the recording.